Welcome to Hail the Queen, a podcast about authenticity, happiness, and pursuing your dreams, things that I am very passionate about. My name is Raina Spasso Van Oust. I'm your host. I'm excited. This is episode number two, and my guest today is Dave Mason. Dave is an attorney turned rabbi and writer. And it's one of his books, The Size of Your Dreams. That is the reason that I wanted to have Dave on the podcast. I ask, and in my conversation with Dave, I ask a lot of questions about the book. Um, but the deeper message of this conversation is the importance of having goals, the importance of reaching for your dreams, of going after your dreams. And this is, this is really uh, what this conversation is all about, um, why it's important to have goals, uh, why it's important to have a destination that you're going, uh, that you're traveling to, uh, why the moment you hit one goal, it's important to set another one, and when you hit that other one, set another one, and so on. Uh, we talk about the difference between having a vision for yourself and vision for others. Um, we talk about why people settle for less. And I believe this this should have tickled your curiosity enough. So I'm going to, to leave uh, to, to leave it at this. One more thing before um, before I share my conversation with Dave with you. If you would like to learn more about the behind the scenes of this of this episode, you can uh, you can do that by following the link in the description of this episode. Well, um, enjoy, subscribe, share with family and friends. And I guess there's one more thing only left for me to say. Enjoy my conversation with Dave. Hello, everyone. Today I am with, um, I'm having a conversation with Dave Mason, the author of The Size of Your Dreams. Hi, Dave, and welcome to Hail the Queen. Hi there. So great to be here. Wonderful to have you. Uh, would you please introduce yourself with a few words to our listeners and viewers? Sure. So I'm Dave Mason. I'm an author. I'm originally from the United States but I moved to Israel when I was 29 and I was originally an attorney and decided, you know what, I want to do different things with my life. I want to have more balance. So I moved into business and I was able to move over to Israel. And here I became a rabbi and I became an author and I started first writing biblical fiction books. And then because I'm just so passionate about learning different areas and I find that there's no better way for me to learn about a topic than when I'm researching and writing that, I started going to other areas of personal growth that really interested me as well. And I wrote a book on really how to envision and manifest your dreams called The Size of Your Dreams. And another one called The Cash Machine on that just has hundreds of financial lessons all embedded in novels because I love teaching through stories. <clears throat> and it, it's interesting actually that you mentioned um, starting from attorney and now a rabbi, you know, your journey into personal development. Was there anything in particular that happened um, that, you know, sparked that transition? Or is it just curiosity, you know, one step, one thing leads to another, to another, and so forth? So really, the attorney level, I think I got into that because, okay, I wanted to do something and I didn't know what. And so, like so many other people, I'm like, oh, law school sounds like a smart choice. And I got into the work and I actually really enjoyed the work. I was doing environmental litigation and I was working for a great organization, but I also saw the lives of my coworkers. And I said, you know what? That's not who I want to become. A lot of them didn't have families. A number of them did have families, but it was really difficult for them to balance time with their families versus time in the office because it was just such a demanding job. And I said, I really want something different. I want a very different life work balance. And so I was still single at the time, but I was getting to that point where I was ready to start building a family. And I said, you know what, where do I want to live? I want to live in Israel. What do I want to be doing? I want to be spending my time learning and growing. 
And so I started a business that I was able to run very part time. That's been a real blessing. I actually sell cabinet hardware, which is totally different from all of my writing or anything like that. And on a website called knobs.co. But doing that is something I was able to do very part time because it's a website. People can you know, buy products while I'm asleep halfway around the world and they're shopping in America and buying things, you know, whenever it's convenient for them, it left me a lot of free time. And so I wound up pursuing my religion and really trying to dig deeper into my spiritual background. And then through that, I wanted to be sharing what I was learning. And so I started writing novels. It's it's so interesting to hear all that because, you know, partially it reminds me of my own, uh, you know, story how by education I'm an engineer. Um, and just like you, when I finished high school, I had no idea what I wanted to, to do with my life. But, you know, that's the moment when you choose which school you go to. And for me, it's like, okay, engineering, that's, you know, that's a good choice. It's a prestigious school, so I'll do that. Um, and now actually... I say that I'm an engineer only at a party as an icebreaker or something is it's um, life took me or I decided to take my life in a completely di different direction. Um, so it's interesting to hear, you know, your story about attorney and going in a quite different, different uh, direction with your life. Um, your book, The Size of Your Dreams, the one that yes. actually led me to reach out to you and invite you to be on Hail the Queen. I must say that I love your book. Um, it's um, I, just as I say that there is so many questions coming up to my mind. I'm like, this one, that one, which, which one should I ask first? Um, let's start with the, the most simple one. What prompted you to write that book? What prompted me to write the book was actually a interesting circumstance we were in. So we'd found ourselves in a difficult financial jam, which was really what prompted me to write The Cash Machine years later, because I realized, okay, I, it's fine. time that I finally started learning about money. And I really did, I knew how to kind of make money, but I didn't really know how to intelligently save it, invest it, use it. And so I was really in a tough financial spot. And part of that tough financial spot was that we'd bought a house that was bigger than we needed. And we spent a lot of money fixing it up way, way over budget. And we just owed so much money. We were really in a tight spot. And so I wound up combining a number of techniques that I'd learned and writing a note card. Mm -hmm. And the note card said that I was going to sell this particular house. We just had to get rid of it. But the problem was we'd put so much money into it that it was higher than a lot of the other houses in the neighborhood. So it was really, we were asking what was considered a lot because our neighborhood just didn't have such nice places. And we'd sunk so much cash that ours was very, very nice. It was going to take a very unusual buyer to come along and, and want this place. And so I wrote a note card that I was going to sell this particular house by, I believe it was July 27th, 2015 for a certain amount of money. And I listed all the steps I was going to take in order to go ahead and sell the house by that date. And i read that card every morning, every evening, several times during the day. And I'd focus myself on all the steps I had to take in order to reach that goal. And over time, the goals would change. I'd try something. I said, no, that isn't working. And I'd replace it with something else. But the, the goal, the date I was going to sell it by and the amount of money didn't change at all. Now, eventually, we did wind up through some very bizarre circumstances, wind up selling the house to some very good friends who were, had never never thought they were in financial position to buy the house at all. And their circumstances wound up changing and they wound up buying it. And we closed on the house and they invited us over, you know, to celebrate. And we opened a bottle of champagne and we drank a toast and I handed them this note card and they looked at that and they said, what is this? And I said, well, I wrote this six months ago. And they were just completely shocked because it was July 27th, 2015. And we just closed for that exact amount of money. So this really wow. showed me the power of setting a really clear intention and carrying it through. And I realized, okay, I need to teach people this. This is a very powerful technique. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not like something like the secret, 
which was very popular a long time ago. The secret would be saying, focus, I want to sell my house by July 27, 2015 for this amount. And that would be it. So there's a lot of people talk about pro the power of intention. And I definitely feel there's a lot to the power of intention. But what separates this technique is the steps and the goals. Like you're, I'm constantly refining what I'm going to do to reach that. If I see that my chosen path is not going to get me there, okay, I need to refine it over time. Now, I don't need to know the exact path when I make the goal. When I first wrote that card, the steps that ultimately got me to selling the house were not the steps I imagined at the time. The steps can change. But what's different from the, yeah. something like the secret or other power of intention ideas is that it's not just thoughts that are very vague and in the ether. It's very much brought down into very clear steps and how we build steps that will get us to accomplish our goal. Yeah, well, what you say makes uh, complete sense because it's, you know, it, it takes um, the power of intention, which is, you know, keep your focus on what you want to do, but at the same time, every day takes steps you know, one step in front of the uh, one foot in front of the other, keep moving to move towards that goal. And at the end of the day, reevaluate how are you doing? Uh, you know, do you still need to continue making those exact steps? Do you need to adjust, add something, remove something and so on? Um, what I love about the book, though, is that it's it's written in a very, um, you know, it reminds me of, of what they say, that if you cannot explain it to a six year old, then you don't really know it. And what you've done is you've, I'm not sure if it's really for a six-year-old level, but you've explained it in a very, very um, easy to understand way. Um, so is, is this something that you do for yourself to um, try to synthesize things in a, such a simple way that you can be like, okay, it's, one, two, three, um, it's that simple. I love taking things and breaking them down into simple stories. So yeah, breaking it down into one, two, three, that is great. But if you can able to take it and build a story around it, it makes it that much clearer. If you can come up with a really good example. And while I did not write this for a six-year-old, I think some six-year-olds could could handle it. My, my son probably could have read it at six. He was, he was reading pretty early. But it's very important to me that at least by sixth grade, that people be able to, to read it. Now, that's not the target market. The target market is an adult book. But I wanted to make it so that kids from middle school age and on could access it, could understand it, could relate to it. Because frankly, those were the toughest years of my life. And I know that the tools that contained it in the book would have helped me tremendously had I had them. And in fact, it was just a couple of years ago um, that we met this girl. My son started a new school and this girl came up to him and said, wow, you know, I read your parents' book and it totally changed my life. And she was exactly that age. And she was having a really hard time in those middle school years and being picked on and feeling very awkward. And the tools in the book really helped her reshape her experiences and change her perspective. And so, that was definitely a goal that it should be accessible from a very young age, even though the target market is still for adults. I mean, take me, for example, um, I've read so many books on personal development and so forth. Um, I've, I've read Think and Grow Rich. I've been in a study group about it, a couple of them, actually. And when I read your book, which... Um, you, you mentioned even in, in uh, the size of your dreams that, you know, part of it is, is you know, you reference Think and Grow Rich in it. Um, when I read it, and I'm still amazed by how simply you have said it, uh, because Think and Grow Rich, as great as it is, it can be very um, overwhelming sometimes and difficult to understand, probably because of the language, because it was written almost a century ago. Um but when I read The Size of Your Dreams, and I was like, I felt a very deep relaxation in me when I was reading. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's just like in Think and Grow Rich, but it's so much more simpler and so much more easier to understand. So a big thank you for that. This is, by the way, how I um, come across your book. It was a friend of mine um, 
I was talking to about a project that I want to do in my home country, Bulgaria, uh, which is uh, it has to do with adolescents. And I talked to him about using Think and Grow Rich about that project. And he said, you know what, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old uh, boys and girls would be interested in reading Think and Grow Rich. But there's this book. And then he mentioned the size of your dreams. You should you should check that book. It's really going to help you there. Um, so that's how I came across your book. Um, oh, great. Well, we'd be yeah. happy to translate into Bulgarian if you'd, you'd like to lead us on that. I have thought about that, by the way, but I'm not that far in my project. So um, I um, it's definitely something I have on my mind. It's just not there yet on my uh, great. outcome card. You wrote the book with your wife, Hannah. How, how was that for an experience to work with your, with your wife on a book? That was a lot of fun. So on the, all four books that I've released, I've always had a co-author. So I've always been the primary writer myself, but I really love the process of working with somebody else. I love the back and forth problem solving side of it. And Hannah and I have written two books together now, The Size of Your Dreams and The Cash Machine. And writing together just allows me to write in a very kind of trimmed down, very efficient way. Like I will write the bam, 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 bam. Here are the things that I want to say. And she'll kind of go in and make them prettier, make the, you know, add dialogues. I'll, like I'll just have a dialogue and it'll be one person... One quote, another quote, another quote, another quote, another quote. I won't even say who's speaking which line. And she'll go and like add the names and the ag- and actions that kind of bring those lines to life so that they're happening in the middle of a of a whole dialogue. It's it's really fun because we'll sit and we'll discuss things. You know, the the end of the cash machine, for instance, was another book that Han and I wrote together. And we were literally in Ecuador, which is where part of the cash machine takes place. We were on a hike. We'd gotten totally lost. And we're sitting there brainstorming the end because the end isn't totally working. And in the end, my son wound up coming up with the how we were going to go ahead and wrap the wrap the whole book up, what the ending was going to be. But it was just doing a family hike. Family hikes have been a huge source of inspiration on our books. It's where we kind of go and hash things out. And we'll go for walks and just talk out the different elements and what's going to happen here, what's going to happen there. So I love the iterative process and I love doing it with somebody else. You know, I think most great writers say that, you know, they've, they've had a great editor in their corners. And for the most part, I prefer using co-authors to editors that it's, it's the, but it's the same thing, you know, a really great editor who's going to be back and forth with you and say, no, you need to do more of this. You need to do more of that. That's a lot of the same process that I'm able to go through with co-authors, but I find they're able to actually jump in and actually work within the text a bit more. It's so interesting to hear that you can be so open uh, in in the creative process to work with someone else. I feel like I would be too protective of 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 my work. So that's that's something to keep in mind. Um, I I, de- I definitely am I definitely am protective, and I, I definitely. Like in the end, like I'll, I'll write a, a draft and my wife will go through and write her edits and her additions. And then I'll go and take them and I'll incorporate them in there. But yeah, I, I can get possessive on wanting to have the final say. Because I do look at the, you know, the books. There, there's certainly more, more contribution is coming from me usually than, than the others. Usually like Hannah didn't even know about this book until like I'd already kind of completed a bit of a draft. I like to keep things secret while I'm working on them sometimes. And then I showed her the draft and I really invited her to come in and join. But I definitely still would, would get possessive. You know, if we, we had an argument about how something should be, I'd probably still say, you know, no, I want it to go this way. And she's always had that perspective of, okay, Dave's put more effort into this. He's got a bit more ownership over this. He's going to have the final say in which way it's going to go. Well, now that I listen to you, it reminds me of something that... Um you guys say in um, in the size of your dreams that um, you you need to start with a vision and when you reach out for the help of others it's not really 
asking them about what they need to do. It's about selling them your vision. So I guess that's why you right. two work so well together because you sold your vin vision or you sell your vision to your co-author, be it your wife or your other co-author. That That's certainly a big part of it. I, I think that Hannah, she's, she feels my excitement when I start a new writing project and she's really open to how she's going to help me out with it, but she's excited to do so. And, you know, I've been excited on, you know, she's got a book that she wrote completely independently of me. And I was really excited when she started that book and I was happy to lend whatever support she needed on that one. But it's very cool when you see somebody really excited about something and you see they're making a lot of efforts and they're creating something new. You can't help but say, yeah, I'd love to be part of that. I'd love to see how I can be joining into that process. You know, I, I actually realized that we're already talking about the book and I'm not sure if if we're actually, if me or you actually mentioned what the book is really about, although I feel like the name, you know, suggests a little bit. Do, do you mind telling, uh, sharing in a few sentences what the size of, the, of your dreams is actually about? Absolutely. So the, the, the book is set in a high school classroom with, there's only four senior students in this class because the regular math teacher had, had he dropped out, he'd had a, a medical emergency, he had to leave. And for a while they're looking for somebody. And so most people just moved out of the class and there are just four of them left. And this new teacher comes in and we say it's a little bit like Think and Grow Rich meets Dead Poets Society with this teacher that comes into this classroom and really works on the way people's minds work. So you've got this successful businessman who decides to go into the classroom and teach. And he wants to see, you know, can the techniques he used out in the world, can they actually work with these high school, in this high school environment? And each of these four students really has something they want to be working on. They've got their various struggles, their various dreams. And the teacher prompts them to be sharing them and to be using the techniques that he's going to guide them through to show them the power of these techniques can have on their lives. And they go through a tremendous number of ups and downs as they go through their process to be each kind of hitting the goals that they have. But the biggest thing is, is in the beginning, of course, just pulling out those dreams. Like how do you, he asked most of them at the beginning, they said, no, everything's fine. Everything's good. I don't really want that much, but he had to dig at first and get to the heart. Like what is it that they really wanted? What is it beneath the surface that they want? And so many, so many of us, we're afraid to dream big. We're afraid to even really develop a dream. We're afraid to say what it is that we want, or we think it's too big and unattainable, therefore we don't want it. And so the teacher has to work with them and prompt them to get them to the point of even sharing or even opening up to a bigger dream and then sharing that possibility with the class and letting the class help each other work through it. This is a great, great moment for me to say that even though, um, uh, you know, the book takes place in mostly in a classroom, I know you said that already, but this is not a book for, for high school um, students only. It's, it's, it's so much more than that. So for anyone who's listening or watching, please don't underestimate the book just because uh, the action takes place in a classroom. Um, the book, I believe, is around 200 pages, but once... Once I started reading it and I reread it every now and then, every time I start reading it, I just cannot put it down. I know what happens. I probably know most of it by heart by now. And still it's, uh, it's so interesting. And the part, um, it's actually one of the books that I recommend to uh, pretty much all my, all my coaching clients. Um, the main reason I recommend it is exactly because of what you just mentioned Um which is usually the beginning of the coaching, you know, process is what do you want? What do you get, want to get out of the coaching? What do you want to get out of life? What is, what is your goal? And this seems to be such a scary question for most people. Um, and I think your book does a great job in, in digging deeper in that. So what do you think? What do you think the reason is for people to be afraid of setting goals? Why do you think people settle 
settle for so little. I think it's fear of disappointment. I think on the one hand, it's fear of disappointing, it's fear of failure. But actually, now that I even say it, I think it's even more so, it's even more fear of success. There's fear of like, what will happen if I put myself out there? Will I fail and be you know totally destroyed by it? Or will I actually be you know, successful and somehow, and then everybody's going to want a piece for me, a piece of me, and I'm not going to have control over my life, and I'm going to sp spiral out of control. It's like it's easy and comfortable to stay in the zone you're in, and only you know grow a little bit, move a little bit forward, move a little bit back, but stay in our safety zone. That's where we we kind of tend to live, and forcing people to think bigger can be incredibly scary. And it's not unusual for people to retreat back to that safety zone and say, you know what? No, I'm okay where I am. I know my life isn't great, but at least it's mine. I know what to expect. I know what I'm getting. I know what I have to do. This big vision you have, okay, that might be good for somebody else, but I, I don't want all that. Just, just, just leave me alone and let me kind of live my small little existence. Yeah. That, by the way, was one of my favorite uh, parts of the book where you say, um, I won't give give too many details away, but it's one of the things you say is one, one reason that so few people achieve the extraordinary is that we get embarrassed by the power of our own greatness. Um, yeah. Which I think you've said so beautifully and um, it's so, so true. Um, indeed, that fear of if I show my true greatness then I'll be here, but then will the rest of my life follow with me? Probably not. Um, and that's scary indeed. Um, one of the other things that, um, that was a big, big takeaway for me, um, is, um, one of the, one of the four students, Kelvin, uh, who, uh, you've you've chosen to write the book through his through his own uh, through his eyes um yes. w why was that why did you choose to to write the book through 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 the eyes of kelvin when i write a book i tend to think that in some ways i'm all the characters there are parts of myself coming out through all of the different characters but to me, two characters more than any are really the ones that I see myself in most. And those are Kelvin being kind of my younger self and you know, my more scared self. And Mr. Griffin, the teacher, being sort of my older, wiser self when I'm in my, my higher moments. And <laughs> to me, first of all, I love first person narratives. I find it a very intimate way of going through, through a book. You get a, a real sense of well, what's happening through somebody's eyes and you can experience it through through their their whole journey but kelvin was just the natural character for me to to do it with because the things he was struggling with are so many of the things that i was struggling with me too me too <laughs> and um yeah and and um the other like I said, I had three major takeaways from the book. Every time I read it, it's still things that when I read them and I have to put the book down for a second and rethink a little bit um, what I'm reading. Um, and again, one of the things you say, and that's what your uh, Mr. Griffin says to, to Kelvin, and um, what he says is, everything you want is attainable, but it comes from building yourself, not swaying others. And... I truly love that sentence, that that advice he gives him, uh, because I recognize that a lot in, again, myself, uh, you know, for spending most of my time trying to adjust myself to be the person that I think the world wants me to be, to to have something, you know, even success, if I think about it, isn't that, um, isn't exactly what, what Mr. Griffin says to Kelvin, you know, what do I need to look, to look like to be successful for people to like me and so forth? Um, 
can you elaborate a little bit on on that advice of you know building yourself rather than swaying the others so first i want to give a bit of context so kelvin himself Good wanted idea. to you know some of the others had more clear cut goals for instance christy who was the captain of the girls swim team she wanted to win the state championship something she felt she she previously thought she could do, but now thought it was totally out of her reach because her coach had been killed by a drunk driver. And you know, Darnell was was heavy set; he wanted to lose weight. Jared, he was trying to raise enough money for him to, to go to college, and and Kelvin really was the socially awkward one of the group, and he wanted to be accepted and he wanted you know the prettiest girl in school to go out with him and he wanted to everyone to kind of come in and love love him and mr griffin is saying you know you're not really having goals for yourself you're having goals for everyone else it's like you want to be you as you are and you want suddenly everyone else to change to accept you and you're willing to maybe change yourself to whatever they want you to be so that they will like you but it's really not setting a goal for yourself. It's really setting a goal for everyone else. And it's really, it's really manipulative in a certain sense. You want to manipulate all these people. Like, okay, what do I have to do? Who do I have to be so I can manipulate these people to accept me so that I will get to be with the cool people. I will feel accepted. I will feel loved. And he said, you know what? This is, can all come, but it doesn't come from having your vision in somebody else's body. It doesn't come from trying to skew others to accept you. It comes from growing yourself. Because when we really turn in and grow ourselves and become greater human beings, like we can't help but draw others towards us and build, build connection. And when we, we build connection that way by growing ourselves to the type of person who, who can build relationships, who can be a good friend, who can be out there and, and connecting with people, then we're going to find those people we can be connecting with. But don't try to say that, you know what, I just need to change everybody else around me. It's a goal that's always going to keep you feeling small. You're always going to feel like you're not enough. As long as your self-worth is being held in somebody else's eyes, you're always going to be lacking. But when you really build genuine self-worth, when you able to enjoy your own presence. That's the one presence you can, can count on. When you build yourself as a person, then you could really be much more accepting of others. Then you could be opening yourself up to relationship with others. True, true. And, you know, trying to, to change others is, you know, is a losing game, no matter how you approach it, no matter how much effort you put into it. At the end of the day, you will lose. You can't do that. Um, Another favorite part of mine, and this is um, something one of the students says. Um, oh, I forgot his name. Um, the one that wants to lose weight with D. Uh, the name starts Darnell. with D. Darnell. Yeah, Darnell. Darnell. Right. So, Darnell. So he uh, he wants to lose weight. Uh, he goes through a setback. But then he comes back even stronger. And when he when he's asked the reason, you know, for the change in his attitude, he says, um, I realize that I'm either going to come out of these 30 days believing that I'm stronger than my challenges or that they are stronger than me. And I love this so much because it's the one thing I've learned about goals is that when you set a goal for yourself, um, you need to stick to it. Because uh, when you stick to it long enough, you would two things would happen. You would either end up achieving your goal, or you would learn why you cannot achieve your goal. Um, would you like to elaborate, elaborate a little bit on on that part? Absolutely, because first of all, it's a bit of a spoiler, but not a huge one. Darnell does not wind up hitting that goal. Darnell fails to hit his goal and he, he fails to hit it based upon, you know, his, his setback had set him back so far that even with all 
this his willpower, he wasn't able to to climb back up and hit that goal. And he's certainly feeling very down about it. But at the same time, the others are feeling very encouraging. And Mr. Griffin says, look, you're not always going to hit your goal. Sometimes you are going to fall short. But then you need to be able to go back and look at it, do what we call post-mortem. You need to really examine what worked for me, what did not work for me. How can I make my goals better? How can I improve upon the goals? And this is why we use you know, a 30-day goal. It was a very you know, short, measurable goal that Darnell chose for his first goal. And he was able to learn a tremendous amount of himself about himself. He was able to actually accomplish quite a bit. He just didn't hit his exact threshold that he was hoping to hit. But he also has to give himself credit for as far as he came. And, you know, we contrast this with some of the other issues that happened in, in the book. But you don't want to pat yourself on the back for coming close when there's still time to go before you're, you're, you've given yourself to achieve your goal. So if the time hasn't elapsed, you're still in this, don't sit back and say, well, it was a good try. Keep going with everything you've got because hitting your goals builds tremendous momentum. But there are times in our lives when we're not going to hit our goals exactly. And the last thing we want to do is allow that to deflate us and make us feel defeat and make us feel like it's not worth setting goals at all in the future. Every time we fail to hit a goal, we need to stop. We need to take stock. We need to look at the goal we, goal we set. We need to look at the steps. We need to really reassess, okay, what is working here? What is not working here? And then you never want to leave a goal accomplished without setting the next one. You don't want to have a gap in those goals. In fact, these switching, switching hats for a second towards the, uh, the, the rabbi side of me, there's a practice. I learn Talmud every day. I, you know, five, day, five days a week, I learn with it with a study partner. We learn, we learn Talmud. We learn about a page a day. And every few months, we finish one of the tractates of the Talmud. This is a, it takes about seven years to finish the Talmud if you, if you learn a page a day like we're doing. And every time you finish one of the big sections, what are called the tractates, there's, you know, we'll have a little celebration for finishing, for hitting a milestone and finishing something. But there's a tradition that we have that we never finish one before we start the next. We never celebrate accomplishment A without setting ourselves up for, okay, what is the next thing we're gonna do? Because, you know, we push ourselves, we go forward, we're, we're getting a lot of momentum. And then oftentimes we cross the finish line and then we fall to pieces because we don't really know what we're focused on anymore. We had such a clear focused goal. We we're working towards it and now we don't. And we become lazy and we become unfocused and we, we lose some of that thread. So it's a real tradition in, in Judaism, whenever we finish, learning anything, whenever we get to the end of anything, we'll stop, celebrate, and start the next thing. In fact, we have a, a holiday every year. If you, you know, the, the Torah is this thing that we read through every single year, and we always finish it on a certain day and then start it immediately afterwards. Five minutes later, we're, we're starting it again the very next cycle. And that's how it is with goals as well. You never want to get to the end and finish a goal without saying, okay, What's my next goal? Did I push myself too hard the first time? Maybe a more reasonable goal would be, would be easier. Did I not push myself hard enough? Did I set kind of an easy one? Well, maybe I want to stretch myself more this next time. Which of my steps were working and I want to keep? Which of my steps really were failures and I want to get rid of? What about my deadline? Is that, was that a good deadline? Do I want to you know, do another 30 days? Do I want to do something a bit different this time? Reassess everything. Take stock about what's working and what isn't, but never stop the process of making goals and aiming towards them, because when you don't, things can fall apart. And I, I know I have personally felt a lot of that this past year, and so many of us have. It's been a really tough period, because I'm, there are so many reasons it's been tough, but one of them has been that life has been unpredictable. It's hard for me to actually assess what's going to happen in a month or what's not going to happen in a month. So a lot of the structures I had in my writing and the places I went to, you know, those got closed down. A lot of the people I was interacting with, I could no longer interact with. A lot of the things I helped to achieve, I couldn't achieve. Like for instance, you know, Mr. Griffin in the book, you know, he runs marathons. 
well, you know what? We had the Jerusalem marathon last year that I'd been training towards and that got canceled. So you set a goal, you know, to be running in a certain race. And then the race, not only is the race canceled, but then they, there's a law that you're not allowed to go more than a hundred meters outside your house. So you can't even go outside and, and go for a run anymore. And so it's been difficult because I'm somebody who thrives on setting clear goals. And suddenly I was in a circumstance that it made it a lot more difficult. And it's easy to pull back and say, okay, so I'm not going to set any more goals. It's too tough right now. I'll wait till this COVID thing is over. But then you can just sit, wind up sitting back and time pass and just feeling like you're not accomplishing anything and feeling like you're stuck. So it's very important that we don't finish a goal without setting a new one. And with Darnell, he didn't hit his goal. He tried very hard to hit it. He said either I'm going to be stronger than my goals or my goal is going to be stronger than me. And he failed. And he went to a place of depression. And Mr. Griffin had to pull him out of that and say, no, 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 no. You had the right attitude going up to the goal. Yes, keep pushing and try to hit it. Try to do that. It's really good if you hit your goal. But if you don't, don't spend all your energy beating yourself up and saying it's not worth making any more goals. Stop, reassess, make the next one, keep the momentum moving. And by the way, when you say fail, I feel it's important to, to point out that I believe his goal was to lose 15 pounds. Um, right. And he fell short three pounds. So um, he was actually pretty, pretty close. Um, and and that that's something that we so often do. We, we focus on what we didn't achieve in, instead of how much he actually achieved, how much we achieved. And uh, so I recognize that situation so well of, you know, getting depressed or feeling low about, about what we didn't do instead of look at, well, oh my God, look at how much I actually achieved in, 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 in that, um, uh, in my strive for this outcome. Um, because we are running out of time here. Um, one final question about this book. I mean, I, I have so many, so many other things that I want to talk to you about this book, but, um, some other time maybe. So, what I'm really interested in is that uh, the book, you actually offer it for free. Also, you can purchase it, uh, you know, on Amazon and so forth, but you can also go and download it on your website uh, as, a, as an ebook. So yes. why did you choose to do that? It's quite an unconventional choice, I would say, um, to give your work away for free. It is definitely unconventional, but... The truth is I wrote this book because I wanted to get it into people's hands. And so I don't want, I don't want cost to be a barrier. I don't want that to get in the way of anybody reading it. And so many of the people who've read this book, in fact, read it because it was free. You know, I, I had somebody write to me, you know, a student in, in South Africa who was clearly not from a wealthy background. And he was telling me how like the book changed his life. But I knew in dialoguing with him, there's no way if I was charging $10 for the ebook that he would have bought it and checked it out. He's, he was not in a financial position to be going out and spending the money to be buying a book and then, then looking at it. And plenty of our readers are in that financial position, but plenty aren't. And my goal was to get the book in as many hands as possible. So what I like to do is, you know, I do hope to make some money for my books. It is not how I provide for my family at all. Fortunately, I have a, a business and that provides, covers the cost of my writing. So the m books don't have to bring in money. I'd like them to bring in money. But really what I'd prefer to do is to be giving away the eBooks totally for free. Let anybody take them that wants to. And then charging money for people who want to go further. So last summer, for instance, we ran a class. We, we had you know, over 50 people who, who joined us to in a class called Dream Design Manifest when we went through... The, all of the principles we teach in the book, and we help people come up with their dreams, design their lives, and then, and then manifest their goals. Now we ran that six-week course. So I'd rather do things like that, get people excited by learning to go further, and then have ways that people can go further, and then I can make my money there. But really, it's not about the money at all. So anybody who can't afford the book, who wants to read it, who wants to work on themselves, please take the book as my gift. Take it. Enjoy it. You owe me absolutely nothing. 
if you're somebody who has more financial means and you want to get the paperback, I can't give that one away for free because it costs me money to print it. Okay, you can buy that and I'll get a couple dollars. You can get the audiobook and I'll get a few dollars from that. Or you can just take the book for free and read it. And then if you say, okay, well, I want to do more work on this, you can actually, my wife, Hannah, is actually a coach. She will actually work with people on, on actually fulfilling their visions that they might set or dream up while reading the book. We might offer more courses. We've offered that course once in the past. It was a big success. And we want to do more evergreen courses that people can take at any point. So we're looking to recording those. But that's really how we look at it. Please take it for free. Enjoy it. Grow from it. Manifest these things in your life. And if you want more in-depth, if you want one-on-one, -on -one, okay, you can work with us then. If you want to do a video course that's really going to help bring it out of you, okay, we're in the process of creating those. But that's really how we look at things. Wonderful. And I know I said this was going to be my last question about the book, but I, I cannot help but ask one more. So since this book offers so many, uh, so many gems, there is so many, um, you know, wonderful tips in it and action points and things to do. And you wrote that book. What would be your advice for people who read the book? How to, um, what to do with it? Um, and to give you a little bit of, of context of why I'm asking this is because one of the things that I've come to realize about, you know, books that can help you change your life is that very often people approach them as, as a novel, for instance. I know this is a novel, but, you know, like, say, War and Peace, you read it, you love it, you close it, you put it on your bookshelf, and that's it, and you never do anything with it. Um, but, like, we started this conversation, it's not just setting an attention, but it's also taking some action steps. So what would be the action steps you recommend to the people who read your book? Number one is the concept of mastermind that we cover in the book. So a lot of people have read this book and started forming mastermind groups. I'd encourage somebody, if they want to read this book and they want to grow from it, maybe instead of doing it by yourself, choose somebody else, choose others who you think you want to learn and grow together with, who you want to be, you want to be encouraging each other, you want to be working with each other, and go through and do the book together. You know, we have mastermind partners. We've got other people that we sit with on a weekly basis and we all work on each other's projects and help, help each other out, help people, help each other figure out how we can dream bigger, how we can accomplish more. And that's a really critical part of it. So find others to help you on your journey, the type of person who's going to help build you up, the type of person who's going to support you, the help of person's, type of person who's going to help you brainstorm ways that you can manifest things in your life. And you can either bring them in after you've read the book, but I think even ideally find somebody and choose to go through the book together and then start filling out the cards. There's three different types of note cards that we really encourage people to use in the book. Go ahead and build these cards. It's very easy. Like the book makes it very clear all the different steps that each of these cards needs to have. And then go ahead, try it. The power of the note cards is in their repetition. It's the type of thing where you read the first thing in the morning, you read the last thing at night, you read a couple of times during the day, and you're just constantly reminding yourself of your goal. You constantly bring yourself back to your goal and the steps you have to take in order to manifest that goal. So go ahead, make the cards. Ideally, bring in a, a mastermind partner or a number of partners in a group and go through the steps together. And I guarantee that you will see huge changes in your life and if you don't, let me know and I'll give you your money back on the free download. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt that if um, if someone reads your book and takes follows the two action steps you just gave that um, they would need a refund. Um, so I'm curious to, to hear though. Um, well, a huge thank you for your time. Thank you for, you know, sharing... Uh, sharing all the you know the the information and your wisdom with us uh where can people find you so the best place is to go to the size of your dreams.com and go ahead and download that free book 
in terms of finding me, as you pointed out, I might be a little hard to find, but you don't need to find me, you need to find the book. So thesizeyourdreams.com, go there and find the book. And again, take it for free with, with our compliments. And we really hope you not only enjoy it, but that it helps you grow your life in a really positive direction. Hey there, it's me, Raina, your host. Thank you for listening or watching. I hope you enjoy this episode. If you'd like to learn more about Hail the Queen, please visit us at arainavanaus.com slash podcast, and you can discover more episodes, fun facts, um, and learn more about Hail the Queen. One more thing before you go. Please leave us a review if you're listening on iTunes. This helps us grow. And of course, share Hail the Queen with a friend or family or someone you think might enjoy the show. Thank you and have a magical day.